Hi, I'm Dom, and I would like to present about the WorldCom scandal. Overview of WorldCom WorldCom is a telecommunications company and the second largest long distance telephone company in the United States after AT&T. The company began as LDDS, Long Distance Discount Service Incorporated, during 1983, and it was based in Jackson, Mississippi. Its main business provides long distance telephone services to businesses and residents. From 1985 to 1995, and from in 1985, LDDS selected Bernard Ebers to be its CEO. The company became traded publicly as a corporation in 1989 as a result of a merger with Advantage Companies Incorporated, and its name was changed to LDDS WorldCom in 1995. They were relocated to Clinton, Mississippi. While in 1990s, they grew rapidly and after completing a number of acquisitions and mergers of 60 companies, it quickly grew up to 65 countries and had 85,000 employees. And in 1995, LDDS acquires voice and data transmission company Realtel for $2.5 billion and they will remain renamed as WorldCom. However, in the year 2000, the telecommunication industry was in decline. Competitive pressure came in due to growth sectors such as the dot-com bubble burst. Shares have tumbled from a high of more than $60 in 1999 to 83 cents in 2002. In the year 2002, accounting fraud was also discovered by internal auditors. SEC files fraud charges against the company. WorldCom also files for Chapter 11, the largest bankruptcy in corporate history at that time. Up to today, it is operating under the name of NCI Incorporated. Okay, there are three things that leads to the scandal. Number one is the motivation and the company culture that they always want to be the number one stock market in Wall Street and very high desire to meet expectations of shareholders. Only positive results are allowed and top down management is very aggressive. Number two, fraudulent financial reporting. Management intentions are making false entries so that company appears profit profitable even during decline. In that case, uh, overstating assets for as much as $11 billion. And the last point, personal interest. Executive personal benefit is way over company's interest. Apple's and CFO were both shareholders of the company. So why do they need the company to be number one? So that they can earn more money from the profits earned? And Another point is that Arthur Anderson, the external auditor, also allowed domineering management behavior and reluctant to probe and conduct substantive tests. So as you can see here, everybody has their own interests. Evers also said to CNN Money that management is not satisfied where we are today. This is not the best day of our life. So you can see that even from the things that he spoke about, he is always very profit driven. Okay, New York Times uh, reported in 26 June 2002 that WorldCom had hit its expenses, which inflated its cash flow by 3.8 billion. As a result, 17,000 employees were to be fired. But this is before uh, this is before the investigation took place. But let's look at more details at who are people involved. First, Bernard Eber, CEO, and Scott Sullivan, CFO. Uh, Bernard Eber actually said this, I wasn't ever advised by Scott Sullivan of anything ever being wrong. And Scott said that he told Bernie that he isn't right. He just stared at it and looked at me and he said, we have to hit our numbers. So if they spoke to the auditors, these two things, who we have to believe and who is saying the truth? Okay, there are also four other people that are involved which follow orders. David Myers, the controller, Buffett Yates, director of accounting, Betty Vincent, director of corporate accounting, and Troy Norman, director of general accounting. 
So there are total uh, six people involved. How the fraud was committed? The accounting fraud was committed over a three year period from 1999 to 2002, totaling at $11 billion. The fraud was accomplished primarily in two ways. Number one, reduction of reported line costs means booking line costs which are interconnection expenses with other telecommunication companies as capital expenditures on the balance sheet instead of expenses in the P&L statement. Number two, exaggeration of reported revenues. Inflating the revenues with bogus account entries from corporate unallocated revenue accounts. As you can see here in the graph, the blue lines referring to Rocom's reported revenue versus the revenue that should be recognized soon as a blue dotted line here. Uh, this is more in line as compared with the two other telco companies, AT&T and Sprint of the red and grey. Uh, this comment here says that if you want to be hired as an accountant in WorldCom, you need to know how to multiply figures. Look at more details of reduction of reported line costs. These line costs were operating expenses and should not be treated like a capital asset. So by treating them as a capital asset, you are actually making the current cost as future cost. This cost should be recognized immediately instead of charging over a longer time period thus increasing the profit in the short term. And these entries were actually booked in the quarter ending month. In fact, they were booked in weeks after the quarter had ended. These entries were also supplemented by an additional $377 million in improper adjustments to reduce the line cost during the period of 2001 to 2002 by a total of $3.883 billion. Uh, referring to WorldCom's line cost expense ratio, it is reported that they are consistently uh, reported uh, having a 42% ratio as compared with other players in the market which should exceed 50%. Number two, exaggeration of reported revenue. Beginning in 1999, WorldCom personnel made large revenue accounting entries after the close of many quarters in order to report that it had achieved a high revenue growth targets that Abbas and Sullivan had established. Revenue opportunities were identified, measured and booked in the amount needed to hit the company's external growth projections. This process is called close the gap. Accounts were also separate from those that recorded the operating activities of WorldCom sales channel. Revenue entries were often uh, involved in large round dollar revenue items in millions or tens of millions of dollars. These accounts also spiked upward during the quarter ending months and the largest spike ranging from 136 million to 257 million. Next, there are two videos that shows about how the parties were caught and how did the auditor detect fraud. Number one, I recommend that the company would have formalized and well-documented accounting policies and procedures 
documentation has to be reliable and verifiable by authorized personnel as well as readily available to auditors for audit testing. Proper internal control should be monitored and revised on a consistent basis to ensure effective and current with technological and other advances. Number two, management review of the financial statements to be prepared for the company. Publicly held companies are required by the Sabines Oxley Act of 2002 to provide a written statement by management validating the accuracy of TFS. This assures outside investors that management has seen and approved the company financial statements before it will be published. And number three, hiring experts in corporate compliances who are well versed in local legislation can help the company to establish anti fraud policies and procedures like certified financial forensics and CPA. They can also check whether the company is running in an ethical manner. Summary of my thoughts. Point number one. There is a conflict of interest by putting their interests above the companies, which also leads to my second point, unhealthy company culture, which was emphasized by making numbers in a top priority instead of reflecting true and fair value. The employees were unable to raise objections safely and mostly blindly trusted their senior officers. In fact, according to SEC, Airbus was the source of this toxic culture that gave birth to fraud. The third, third point, which is management being too passive and the board is lack of awareness. They leave it all to Airbus to take control, which resulted in weak regulatory environment and lack of internal control. The fourth, failure of morals and ethical values, which also leads to failure of corporate governance. Lastly, inadequate external audit done by Arthur Anderson. Anderson could have highlighted the journal entry errors and advise the correct accounting treatment accordingly to GAP, which could have prevented the fraud. So this state of corporate crime led to the Surveillance Oxley Act in July 2002, which strengthened disclosure requirements and the penalties of for fraudulent accounting. In the aftermath, WorldCom left a stain on the reputation of accounting firms, investment banks, and credit rating agencies that has never quite been removed. Quote from Benny Thompson, who is an American politician chairman of the Committee on Homeland Security. Unfortunately, WorldCom is not the only company caught up in this kind of accounting scandal. The impact this will have on the general public is yet to be seen. Indeed, I agree that there are more work to be done. This study is based on SEC website. Thank you for watching and listening. Goodbye.